Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host. Welcome to the latest episode of the Church Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Jason Day, and I had the opportunity to speak with Jamie Mertens this past week. Jamie has been a church planting pastor in Colorado for the past 15 years, and he has pastored in a variety of contexts, which you will hear about in just a few minutes. As a result, he's experienced the many ups and downs that come along with church planting. Jamie currently serves as the church relations manager at Mops International, which is a nonprofit that creates gatherings of moms all over the globe. On this week's episode, Jamie and I talk about keeping ministry simple. We also discuss how to create space for people to belong and grow. We talk about the often untapped power of young moms in your community and specific ways your church can connect with young families. So now let's jump into my conversation with Jamie Mertens. Jamie, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, we are really excited to be able to jump into the conversation with you today. We're really honored to be a part. Awesome. Now, Jamie, you've been involved in some uh, some creative church planting over the past decade or so. I know we could probably talk for hours on this, but <laughs> sure. can, yeah, can you can you share a kind of quick snapshot of your church planting journey? Absolutely. Well, for the past 15 years, we've been church planting in different capacities and in really different environments here in Colorado. We've been able to partner with and kind of revamp movements and uh, some youth churches with some mega churches. We've also started uh, a youth church with a small rural church in the Boulder area, which was a lot of fun. Very unique uh, kids up there in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, then we ended up planning a church in downtown Denver that was kind of a reverse engineered church. We just basically started asking some really pivotal questions about what it takes to form a gathering of people around the mystery of Christ. And so we just started asking questions. And what started happening was all of a sudden the conversations just started getting a little bit bigger. And all of a sudden we had two living rooms having these conversations and praying together. And we were sitting there we're like, man, we should probably get the living rooms together at some point, maybe worship. And so we started doing that. And then in those worship moments, we were like, man, maybe we should start having someone teach. And pretty soon we kind of fell into uh, a church gathering happening very consistently. And we were able to really formulate that into a really well-rounded community expression. It it was amazing because what we started seeing in Denver was this group of really jaded post-church, you know, intellectuals. These are the folks listening to NPR, the thick frame glasses, big beard, skinny jeans, you know, walking into (laughs) church. And, uh, but these are the folks where, you, you know, they had a bad taste in their mouth from some instance in the church, but they're still looking for spiritual expression here in Denver. And so we, we basically devote ourselves, you know, to asking some really pivotal questions. You know, one of them being, you know, if we were the, say the first hundred Christians here in Denver, what would we do? And we started off, we were like, well, we'd probably keep it pretty simple. You know, we'd probably have people over for dinner and maybe pray and read the word together. And we'd probably start there. (laughs) And so keeping everything really simple, you know, we were able to really respond to what God was doing in the community. So all of a sudden we started seeing these really art, beautiful artistic expressions coming through. All of a sudden these uh, jaded intellectual hipsters wanted to uh, really start progressively participating into sacramental theology and what liturgy means and going back to some of the basics, you know, to the desert fathers, you know, the rule of St. Benedict and some of these other elements. It was really fun, you know, going way back into church history to look at some of these elements of the church and bringing them forth in a new way, hopefully, for these post-modern day church seekers, (laughs) which was really great. (laughs) That's awesome, Jamie. That's, that's super cool. Absolutely. Now, as you as you're saying that, it seems that uh, with that church plant there in Denver, that you guys were in a position where you were able to be um, relatively agile. That's correct. Yep. You know, really, really, the name of the game for us, we would say over and over and over, we want to keep everything lightweight and low maintenance and mm. high quality. You know, really, we want to keep things as simple as possible for the purpose of being able to respond to what we saw God doing in the community versus manufacturing something and then asking God to bless it. You know what I mean? Right. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. So can Absolutely. you can you share a little bit with us about maybe 
um, a couple stories out of that that plant that would help kind of help us understand, you know, how you were approaching ministry that might look a little differently from like a typical church plant or a traditional church plant. Uh, one story that pops up to mind in particular was really a story of all inclusivity, keeping everything simple and making sure above all, we are seeing people first and then maybe what we're trying to quote unquote accomplish second. We started this really great network of house churches, and basically the way that we formulated our church, you know, basically we kind of got on the whiteboard and wrote a a church model that we've never seen before, but that we really loved. And it was a response to what we saw God doing in these post church, uh, in this post church crowd. And so basically what we did was we called ourselves a network of house churches that met on Sunday nights. And when we meet on Sunday nights, then we would have our house church actually host the gathering it's to really create that, you know, um, really taking the spotlight off maybe one central leader. You know, part of our story, if I can pause right there real quick, part of our story is, you know, in three of the five churches we work for, you know, we've seen some of the really bad days in the church where, you know, very predominant church leaders are making national news for bad decisions or you know, that actually happened in one of the staffs that I worked at, the head pastor, you know, let's just say a lot of secrets came out on national news and whatnot about, you know, his personal life. And then there was another church we worked at where, unfortunately, the head pastor's son, who was pastoring the church for about 10 years, had to go to federal prison because of certain decisions he made. And so we're looking at the destruction that happens when, you know, we, we all were part of churches where, you know, this happened in one form or another. And we seeing the destruction that happened in those places and the genuine hurt that that caused people, well, that really caused an impetus in us to really make sure we decentralize the church and really equip as many people as we can and give as many people a role as we can to promote that healthy culture. So that, God forbid, if one of the leaders were to step aside in a good or bad way, the community wouldn't crumble because it would not have been built under one person or one person's perspective. And so that's really how we approached everything in this house church. So going back to the story then, what that would look like, you know, so we had this network of house churches really keeping everything as simple as possible. We would keep uh, one part of our liturgy in our house churches would be praying basically for the people around you in your world. And so there was one, (laughs) there was one night, one of our house churches were meeting and one of the girls, she raised her hand. She's like, I've been praying for my neighbor, you know, for about six months now. Is it okay to invite them? And of course we're sitting there like, (laughs) yes, please invite them no matter who they are. And she's like, well, I don't know, this might be kind of weird. And we're like, no way, just go for it. We need to be, you know, (laughs) before we have the conversation of beliefs and Christianity, we need to create a place of safety and trust relationally first right. before we can even have that conversation. So it was amazing. This young lady came the next week and her friend, you know, this is a very, you know, young NPR listening young lady, you know, young 20s, very trendy, whatnot. And uh, she walks in with a 68 year old blind Muslim gentleman. And very traditional, you know, Muslim garb, whatnot. And they had been talking for the past year about, you know, this dinner that their friends are just having every week in their in their kitchen. And so she simply just asked, would you like to join us for dinner? And, you know, and she gave them a heads up that, hey, we're going to read the Bible a little bit. And if you if it would be OK, we'd just like to pray for you. Wow. And, you know, not in the sense of, oh, my gosh, we need to all lay hands on him to convert him, you know, or anything of sort. It was, no, just come to the table and be. Right. Because right. you have so much to bring that we need. And hopefully we can contribute to your journey as well. And so sure enough, this uh, blind Muslim gentleman ended up playing a part in the house church for a year and a half. Wow. And it was amazing. Everyone was very accommodating. And it actually promoted such a healthy house church culture that there at the kitchen table, they were practically seeing how to live an all inclusive ministry lifestyle where you're simply just bringing the kingdom versus trying to force an agenda. Wow. That's, that, that's super cool. Now, uh, Jamie, I know that, that we've talked a bit and I know that your church was very effective at reaching young families. Mm-hmm. So, so let's dig into that a bit. Um, first, why, why were young families so important? Uh, Yeah, you know, young families, in our opinion, it's such a crucial time in life. If we kind of 
look at the life timeline kind of from 50,000 feet from beginning to end, you know, typically in ministry, we see this very common trajectory of, you know, a young person maybe growing up in the church, you know, they'll be involved in youth group. And once they're involved in youth group, they might, you know, go off to college. And that might be about the time where they start to, you know, play a lesser part in the church than they might have before. Or they might, you know, maybe leave the church altogether to kind of find themselves. You know, the first time they have freedom, they're adults, they're getting into their careers. But once those folks start having kids, all of a sudden the weight and the responsibility of child of child rearing comes into play and moms and dads are kind of looking around. They're like, oh man, we need some help. <laughs> right. uh, you know, my wife and I, we have a one and a half year old. And let's just say, as soon as we found, found out that we were pregnant, man, we've been living in that urgency of, oh my goodness, I do not feel prepared to fully right. make sure this little person grows into a fine human being. And so it's a beautiful intersection right there where, you know, at that point in life, you know, young parents are looking to connect. They're looking to help or to, to maybe gain help and maybe also contribute at that time. And when we can get a young family involved at that stage, it is extremely likely that you are creating a very long term kind of legacy type of relationship with that family to where hopefully those children will grow up in the life of the church. And so really, you know, as we look at this common trajectory of parenthood, for us, it was really, you know, doing what Jesus did so well in creating little environments of empathy and compassion. And so for us, uh, the first time someone would show up to maybe a house church, they're sharing their story, you know, just to create that empathy. Because really, at the end of the day, the most valuable thing, in my opinion, that we can give our congregants is each other. Mm. You know, as a as a pastor, I in all the churches I've worked at, I, I received very few emails uh, from new people asking me about maybe what sermon series we were doing, you know, maybe what our budget looked like that year. But I would have one email come in constantly a dozen times a day. And that was, hey, we're new to town looking to connect. Right, right. And so, great. Let's connect you. Let's not talk about salvation. Let's not talk about all these things yet. Let's simply create an environment for you to connect very well, <laughs> as simply as possible. You know, we have time to have the rest of the conversation. Let's have time to almost, you know, just let's let the relationship grow a little bit. And so, so when we see what Jesus did in the New Testament, he created this, I mean, well, actually to, you know, really maybe dial it back even a level bigger, maybe that's the why behind Jesus. One of the main whys behind Jesus was to create, God wanted that empathy, that compassion, you know, and so that's why he sent his sons to gain the empathy, the compassion, the human experience. And so as we are creating avenues to enter into that human experience with one another, I think that's when we start truly seeing one another and we start making very deep connections. It's because of that empathy. And so for us, moms were always the masters of empathy because it's when we look at a mom, they are the first on every level of the human experience to experience the wild life jolting shift that is parenthood mm. on every level. Right, you know, right. they're, they're experiencing it ultimately physically, ultimately, you know, relationally, emotionally, spiritually. I mean, it is, it is, it is devastating and more uplifting than at the same time than we have probably ever experienced before. I just had a buddy of mine, he's a filmmaker from New York, came in. He's four months into his parenthood journey. And I asked him, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, hey, Andy, well, how would you describe parenthood in one word so far? And he looked at me, he's like, oh, easy. It's unbearable. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm like, wait a minute. And I immediately, I just heard that is bad. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, the moments of good are so good your heart might almost actually physically burst because oh, yeah. you can't take all the love in in one gulp. And also the tough times, oh my word, they are the craziest, most sleep depriving, messiest, loudest, most chaotic moments right. you know, that we're experiencing, especially at that point in life. And so we know that because a mom has experienced these things, that's why we say these you know, phrases like, oh, mama knows. <laughs> mama's been there and it's true because mama knows because she 
ha- she has so much empathy because of the experience she's gone through. And again, too, I, you know, I don't, I don't mean to let, let all of us dads off the hook. There's obviously a lot that we contribute, but man, nobody can contribute the way a mom can to raising a child on every level. And so when we get mom in the mix and we connect, when we can connect a mom into one of our, you know, house churches or one of our gatherings, we know that we're actually connecting an entire family because that mom is oftentimes a driving force behind, you know, a family going to church. Because we know if mom was going to church, the family is probably going to be right behind her. (laughs) And so uh, the cool thing about that then is we get to, uh, you know, we simply get to create empathy. We get to create an environment then for mom. You know, as church planners, shifting gears a little bit, as church planners, I I think we get caught up in um, the expectation of our role when it comes to growing people. You know, I think sometimes we assume too much on our side and uh, we, we might hold on a little bit. And maybe I'm just speaking to my own personal experience, but I know I would hold on far too long or far too tight when I just need to kind of let go and, and see what God would want to be growing in these communities. And so the image I like to use really is that of a greenhouse keeper. You know, the process of photosynthesis, the actual process of a, say, a rose going from a a bud into a full blossoming, blooming rose, you know, that process of photosynthesis, we have very little as humans that we can do to, to, you know, straight from our hands to that plant to actually affect that, you know, as much as we squeeze that plant with our fists, as much as we yell at that plant, you know, we're probably going to be doing it more harm than good if we just kind of leave it alone. But what we can do as church planners we can create a environment around that plant that's conducive for growth. And part of that, I believe, is creating this place of safety and trust and empathy for one another. That's good, man. That's that, that's solid. Now, as you were engaging with these moms, are there specific mm-hmm. things that, that you were doing to encourage moms, to value moms, you know, to make those connections? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, that's kind of how I got involved in moms. You know, really... When it came to, you know, to to answer your question, really the biggest thing we tried to do is simply just create that place, create a landing pad, create a room with a bunch of empty place settings at a table for moms just to come in and be together first. You know, it's um, it's kind of funny. I I talked to the beautiful part of my job now being able to work from ops is I get to talk to pastors all day. And we get to strategize and we get to, you know, maximize the impact that mops can have in their community. And I find myself saying the same thing to all of our pastors on the phone and all the, you know, the house church leaders that we've led in the past. And that is, again, with this same vein of simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I think specifically for our modern mom, the schedule is so packed. The right. to-do list is so long. And now just with the, the amazing tools of social media and smartphones and all these good things, we, these are amazing tools. But now we just have a lot more volume in the room where maybe it was a lot quieter and maybe a little bit more relational, you know, even just a couple of years uh, ago. And so we realized no matter what we do, it has to be simple, 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 really easy on ramp, really easy goals. And over the entire experience, making sure to give as much roles and, and not just delegation, but really creating a sense that John Maxwell talks about. He he says, when we have created a sense that we don't win without you in our cultures, that we've won. When, we, when our people feel so important to what we're doing, that if they show up one Sunday, something crucial to the service probably isn't going to happen because that's what we've given that person or that's what that person has grown into or has totally hold in or held for the community. And so for us, you know, no matter what it looks like, it has to be simple. We have to make sure that we're, you know, uh, giving moms a role to play, but then really I think, you know, in reaching those moms, just creating a space is really 99% of it. You know, I would oftentimes tell my house church leaders, uh, unlock your front door, set a plate at your table and you are 99% of the way done. Right. Right. Let mom show up, sit down and, and simply like if we can, if we as leaders, if we, you know, are good greenhouse keepers, you know, we're going to have a jug of water in one hand and we're going to, you know, 
uh, have some pruning shears in another because we're going to try to do everything we can to nurture and to water, but ultimately realizing that this is a journey that this person is on with God that we're entering into. Our church isn't the final answer for this person's salvation, maybe. You know, maybe this is just one stop in the journey, and that's great. You right. know, we we oftentimes like to use the image of a parade as well. You know, we considered uh, Bloom was the name of our or Bloom is the name of church still going today. And uh, we would say when someone joins Bloom, they're basically joining a parade and they might only be walking with us for a month in that parade or sorry, for a, sorry, a, a block, maybe a city block in that parade, or they might walk the entire parade route with us. Either way is amazing. And so what that meant then was having a lot of on ramps, a lot of places to connect. And so we made volunteering a really big deal. Um, and we put very pastoral people heading those volunteer teams. Um, it's amazing, you know, as we mentioned that email that we often receive, you know, hey, we're new to town looking to connect. You can take that in so many different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a small group setting. It can be a mentoring relationship. It can be serving at the church. You know, it, it's whatever you see an opportunity being in the community for someone to connect, I would, I would pull the trigger. I would absolutely um, be as as member involved as you can be. You know, it's it gets a lot more messy that way when we're <laughs> coordinating right. a lot more people. But that's the work of ministry. You know, when when we are called pastor, we are called to simply play. Well, I don't I don't mean to sound cheeky when I say this, but essentially we're kind of playing checkers with people and we're trying to really position people well to maximize you know, their story or position them well with a role or position them, you know, maybe uh, in a spot of. Uh, you know, just positioning them well, if say they've gone through some trauma, maybe they need a, a season of mourning and, you know, we can release people into that and we can just help people in their journey where they are. It, it gets very messy because there's not one road though. <laughs> right, know? right. There's not one clean path. And so, you know, in my opinion, the, the messier our ministry gets in that sense, I think probably the healthier our environments are in that sense. Yeah, no, that, no that's good. And, and I love just kind of the idea that you talk about of just making that space, you know, and the imagery mm -hmm. use of, of the greenhouse, you know, you're, you're creating an environment where people can bloom. Right. And Correct. so I love that. I'd like to see if we can't dial in a little bit more. Uh, so we have, sure. you know, pastors, ministry leaders listening and, and kind of get into more, more, some more practical nuts and bolts, maybe as to how, if a pastor's listening now, and mm -hmm. they're like, yes, I mean, they're sitting there nodding their head as, as they're listening along. Yes, creating this space, um, you know, these gatherings where people feel safe and, and feel like they can belong, you know, belonging mm -hmm. is a key component, I think, of, of what you've been sharing. And, and they're thinking, you know, specifically as we're trying to reach young families or young moms, what mm -hmm. are some practical steps that a pastor who's like, yes, this is the direction that I think we need to go. You know, I, I feel God is in this. What are some practical mm -hmm. steps that they can take specifically for helping create some of the space for young moms? Well, number one, I would encourage you. Um, well, it, it's interesting. I, I've noticed a lot of a lot of uh, church staffs and including the ones that I've formed or been a part of, you know, they're definitely very male heavy. And for whatever reason that is, you know, whatever good or bad reasons that is, you know, I think I think it's first good for us to realize that, first of all, we do have more of a male voice into the modern day church. And it's good just to realize that. Number one, it's not a good or bad thing. It's just a, a thing to realize. And so to counteract that, one thing that is so tremendous, I think, for us, especially if there's not a lot of female leadership on our pastoral teams, is to start talking to female leaders in your community and start, you know, asking them, hey, what have you been seeing in the church lately? As a woman, you have a perspective that I don't. And for a pastor to be able to uh, humble themselves and ask those questions to gain understanding, not only are you gaining knowledge for your community, but you're also in a practical way um, really showing that participant in your church or community that you really do care about them, that you really do want to give them a voice to share. And when somebody has a voice like that to share, especially the top leadership, oh man, you've just created a very deep connection there that will probably last quite a while. And again, another step towards that safety and trust. Uh, another thing I would recommend as well, after, you know, just uh, creating more awareness of, you know, um, you know, 
the mom or the female experience in a particular community, then I would respond however that looks. It might look like just creating a small group for moms to come and be and, you know, just connect with one another and starting simply. Uh, maybe uh, if you're seeing in your community that there is a huge population of, say, teen moms, man, pay attention to that and really pray on God. What do you have here? And why why am I seeing this very specific group of moms in my community? Well, it's probably you're probably in your community for a very specific purpose. And it's that that awareness that you have of the needs in your community that will ultimately create those solutions in a very localized ministry sense. You know, I am, especially in my earlier ministry days, I feel like I would go to a lot of the big conferences and get, you know, really jazzed up. And man, those conferences were pivotal and crucial and still are to my development. I'm trying to go to everyone I can. And what I notice is when I come back, I immediately try to do, say, what Andy Stanley was doing at North Point, say in Boulder, Colorado. And that just doesn't work. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I learned with bitter, that lesson with bitter tears, I feel like, you know, the question really much being, you know, God, what are you doing specifically in our community and how can we learn from different communities? But God, what are you doing in our specifically or our community specifically? And that's probably going to be that unique thing that's going to create that very potent culture in your church is responding than to those things that you're seeing in the community. So yeah, that could look like just getting volunteers out in the community. It could just be um, like being, just serving in the community. Just all the, I think when we start to overthink the solutions, I think that's where we tend to actually get off into an area we don't need to be in. <laughs> right. Like when we start overcomplicating the strategy, then I think we're, we might actually be backpedaling than progressing in a kingdom sense. And again, I, I do want to make sure that we propose, you know, due diligence and and strategies and goals and vision, tremendous things that I will <laughs> I will always be on the bandstand for. With that, we need to make sure we have a healthy balance of responding to what God's doing on a local level as well. Right. No, that makes sense. So so we're not just trying to to uh, come up with our own ideas as to what the problem might be and how we might solve it, but we are stepping back and, and trying to uncover what God's already doing and, and really what's what's going on in the community instead of kind of superimposing our our own thoughts or ideas, exactly. right? You know, I have, a, I have a dear mentor of mine. His name's Ed, and he's a tremendous uh, author, writer, uh, writer, speaker, the whole thing. He got invited to the Vatican with about 200 other uh, evangelical church leaders uh, several years ago, and they were able to peek into a meeting of the archbishops uh, discussing some projects on the table. And he was blown away by the response of this one archbishop. Basically, they had this uh, this proposal on the table. And how it was proposed was, if we propose this project right now, and if we start implementing today, we are going to start seeing fruit in 250 years. <laughs> and unanimously around the table, all the archbishops said, yay, we're in favor. Wow. And to me, that blows my mind because, I mean... I feel like I get in such tunnel vision as a church planner. I forget that the church has been around for 2000 years. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, that people have been figuring out how to do this thing we, we call church for so, so long. And so what that caused us to do, that caused us, as we mentioned before, you know, we really got into a lot of the very early church movements to see, okay, what are these universal things um, that are speaking into life in 2018? And how do we kind of bring these places together because I, I think um, I think unfortunately too many of us and and I'm I'm raising both my hands admitting fault here myself um, I think oftentimes we expect that we're going to come in and be the savior of a community but really that's God's job right 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 <laughs> you know and and that's the tough part of ministry because it's the ego is something to keep so in check because when people are praising God and facing the stage and you're leading that prayer, you're just physically in the room receiving that attention. And very oftentimes, you know, we got to make sure that we are not getting credit for what God's doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I heard Andy Stanley say something brilliant that just blew my mind. He said at this conference, I was just at a couple of weeks ago. He said, it's amazing how much ministry can happen when no one cares about getting the credit. Right. 
And to me, that is, that is, there's so much right there um, that I've just been, I, I'm still studying that one line over and over and over because it's so true. It's so true. You know, when we, when we give up our own platform to hopefully promote someone else's platform, and maybe, you know, if we are the lead pastor, the best thing we can do is we can give one of those young pastors an opportunity to fail scratch their face up, get back up, learn from it and keep going, you know? Right. Right. As John Maxwell says, failing forward together, you know, and man, that is just a, when, when we can get that dynamic with our own church staffs, with our volunteers um, and all the way down, you know, the uh, chain of command in our church communities, man, we're, that's where we see some beautiful, beautiful, diverse culture doing some very unique, effective kingdom tasks. That's awesome. That's awesome. And as you're telling that story about the Vatican, you know, I was thinking oftentimes as as pastors, we have this sense of urgency. And and I sure. think there's a that's a good thing, right? Because we know that yeah. there are people all around us who really uh, are broken mm-hmm. and, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're in this place where they need the, the wholeness and the hope and the love yeah. and the forgiveness mm-hmm. of Christ. Right. And so that urgency, I think, is is important. But at the same time, you know that reality as you're saying we we need to remember that god has already been at work before we showed up he's going to be mm-hmm. at work after we're gone right the, the holy <laughs> right. spirit is at work and <laughs> right. and we just get to play a part in in what god's already doing so don't get too caught up in in ourselves or our activities or our you know our ideas and our strategies not that those are bad things but oh, how totally. do we, how do we submit those to the spirit and mm-hmm. you know and that kind of continuously seeking so we have this sense of urgency but also this understanding of the bigger picture exactly well that's kind of funny you mentioned that um bloom was an interesting space we set it up very intentionally it was very dark the only <laughs> sorry i'm just i'm imagining the space and it is very cheeky it's basically it, it would always be in a church basement with folding chairs set up in a huge circle ton of candles everywhere and the reason for that was You know, specifically in that community, we were responding to this thing of coming out of all this pomp and circumstance in the church, all this overproduction. And so we were kind of like this pendulum on the other side that looked a little sketchy with just a ton of candles everywhere and this really mellow space. But the beauty of that was uh, our first sermon series we did was on Ecclesiastes you know, where the writer Colette is saying, Havel, Havel, it's all Havel. Basically he's saying it's all vanity. It's all dust. Right. (laughs) And if we did that starting a church (laughs) in say somewhere, somewhere else that might be a more conservative or maybe a a different culture than in downtown Denver, man, that would be just the wrong message right there. (laughs) And so, you know, it, it, it is tremendous, you know, when we look at keeping, just as you said, you know, keeping this good balance of urgency and Havel at the same time, almost. <laughs> it's, right, right. It's the urgency of the kingdom and what God's doing and our due diligence in that, what he's called us to. But also it's a realization that I am not Jesus himself. <laughs> exactly. And so I need to stop acting like it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff, Jamie. Now, if, if our listeners want to learn more about how um, they can connect with, you know, young families in their community and kind of encourage these safe places of belonging and, and those types of things, what are some resources that, that they can check out? Or, or where would you direct a pastor who's listening right now? They really want to connect with young moms, really want to connect with families in their community and create these safe gathering spaces um, wh- where would they go? Excellent question. So first thing, I'm going to send you straight to MOPS. MOPS stands for Mothers of Preschoolers, but what we do, we start motherhood gatherings all over the globe. Uh, right now, we have about 5,000 groups all over the nation, and we're in about 48 different countries. And really, all we do, um, for the pastor especially, is we, we really do two main things. Number one, we kind of create that platform for moms to gather in the community by having the church host a mobs group that can be their their own mobs group. You know, it's not a it's not one of those things of you know we want to build the mobs name up. We simply want to plug those moms into the local church. And so the cool thing is, mobs has been around for about forty five years now. So moms know about mobs and they're actively looking for mobs groups. Uh, so this for me has always been 
one of the biggest benefits in partnering with Mops as a church planner, because really the two biggest things I would glean from Mops would be number one, the platform of Mops searching for Mops in the community. They'd search for a Mops group, get connected, make friends with our Mops moms. And then very naturally, we'd see their families attending church and becoming part of the life of the church, you know, even only a few months later. And then the second thing we noticed too was Mops does a world-class job at equipping and training their leaders. You know, as Mops is all over the world now, we want to make sure to equip moms in any context, you know, rural areas, large metro areas. You know, we have really tremendous leadership materials now that we uh, train our moms with and really, you know, equip and lead them well to formulate that type of space to really create that safety and trust. And then forming those relationships, bringing Jesus into the conversation, and then handing that mom off to the church and letting the church does what the church, or letting the church do, I should say, what the church does best. And so for, for me, again, just to summarize, yeah, mops can actually funnel those moms in. They actually have, uh, right now, we have, I think we just pulled the numbers, we have about 70,000 moms per month searching for mops groups through our website. Wow. Um, nationwide. And so the cool thing is, you know, if you're in a metro area, I can guarantee you we have at least 100 moms per zip code per month searching if you live anywhere near one of the big cities. And even like right now, Chicago, New York, Florida, L.A. are giant hot spots for mops right now. Um, we're actually heading to L.A. in two weeks uh, for the Catalyst West Conference there because we have so many moms actively looking for Mops groups, we do, we're going to just try to equip as many pastors uh, as possible to host one of these gatherings to then get that mom involved in the life of their church. And so it's pretty cool seeing just the natural progression of this. My brother, he he started his Mops group. Uh, he's a pastor in Chicago, a campus pastor there in uh, just north of Chicago, actually. They have had over a thousand moms per zip code in that area searching for a Mops group per month. It has been insane the amount of mops or moms looking for mops groups right there. So they started their mops group. They're a church of probably about 300 or so. And yeah, within a couple of years, they ended up more than doubling the size of their church just with their mops group. They ended up having like 150 moms and 300 kids show up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It was incredible. Now, again, I want to set a correct expectation. We can't expect that to happen in every church the first day. But it is right. Very- but if you're if you're looking to reach moms, Correct. and you're looking to reach young families, then what Mops provides, and this is intriguing to me, because what Mops provides then is what I'm hearing you say is a, an opportunity to help develop leadership within the the moms in your community in your church, mm-hmm. and and have an opportunity to reach moms who aren't connected in to other churches, and mm-hmm. and really. You know, that leads to, you know, developing those relationships and you know, it's that safe space again and those conversations happen and there's that affinity amongst moms and which leads to spiritual conversations, which leads to sharing the truth of Christ and connecting them into the, you know, the body of Christ, that local expression, the church there. And um, it just sounds sounds pretty awesome. Thank you, Jason. No, you hit it right on the bullseye there. That is exactly what we're up to. And the cool thing is we're seeing this just happen over and over and over. Um, I probably hear two things probably six times a day. And that is, number one, I hear from mom leaders all the time, uh, mop saved my life. And the cool part about that is we're the moms that we're seeing saying that, you know, they were moms that just moved to their community, didn't know anyone. They found their mops group, ended up finding like their pediatrician, veterinarian. You know, they totally got set their family set up in the neighborhood by connecting to a community of moms. They find Christ in that gathering. They get baptized in the church and then they end up starting another mops group in the church. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, like, that's the story. It's amazing. That's why I like, you know, I probably said simple 800 times in our session today together because the simpler we keep it, I think that's when we give, you know, the most room for God to do what he does best. So that's why really in the context of everything is simple, simple. So the second thing um, that I probably hear all the time then is really that that story that we heard of, yeah, we were new to town. We found, we got our family totally hooked up in our new community. We have friends now. 
And those friends have led us into our church life. And that church life is now the new chapter our family is needed in our family's life. And it's all because we're just trying to form relationships. That is awesome, brother. So what, what is the website for Mops, actually, if someone wants to go check it out right now? Mops.org. That's M-O-P-S. Or I was going to say, you know, we have a really great team. You know, every time we start one of these groups, we do it on a very relational, individualized basis. So we actually have a team member um, basically start a conversation with you and walk you through all the steps um, to get started. Really, to get started with Mops is very easy. Uh, all you need is just one leader to be the point person. You need a thumbs up from the church. And then we have a little agreement that the church signs. And that's really it. Um, that's really all it takes to get a mops group started. And, you know, financially, too, we work on an individualized level for church planners and, you know, for maybe more established churches. We want to make sure that we are not breaking the bank or anything of sort. We want to make sure that we are able to equip everything we can equip that mom with and not put any strain on the church budget. That's awesome, brother. Now, I just uh, want to thank you for being with us here on Church Leaders. It's been some great stuff. We dug into all kinds of different topics, and um, and I really love the fact that we we were able to land on on um, the, these practical ways to kind of uh, you know launch ministries that are reaching young moms, reaching young families, because that's really what so many of our pastors you know are, are kind of focusing on is how do we reach the the younger generations, the young families, mm-hmm. you know, so that we can have an impact on those families. And uh, share the hope of Christ with them. So thank you so much, Jamie. We certainly appreciate you being with us on the podcast today. Thank you, Jason. And if I can just one last time, it's mops.org. You can email start a group at mops.org or you can call 888-910-MOPS. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity. God bless. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast, and if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.